Anxiety is still going to be there. That's that's a kind of given. It's how you respond to it, how you're reacting to it that's most powerful and finding it in the best possible way. Hi there, I'm Bex Craig and you're listening to the Not Just Anything podcast for women who want it whole. I hope you'll join me each week as we hear extraordinary stories from women around the world about how they've curated a whole life by design rather than by default. On today's episode, I'm speaking to coach and author Aggie Heal. Aggie has lived and worked all over the world and is passionate about coaching people from all walks of life. Her book, Generation Panic, which is released tomorrow, watch this space, is on a mission to provide tools and techniques for professionals struggling with anxiety. In our conversation, Aggie courageously shares her own story of anxiety, what motivates her about her work, how the pandemic has impacted people's mental health, and what prompted her to work with individuals to stay energized, positive, and resilient. Let's get stuck in. A very warm welcome to my lovely friend, Aggie Hill, who's joining me from Singapore. Welcome, Aggie. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Bex. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Um, I've been looking forward to our conversation. And usually on our podcast, as you probably know, we start with a question of of who, who are you? And as you know, because you're a coach, we believe that all of us are kind of multifaceted, full of different parts of our that labels and things that make us who we are. And so if I ask you that question of what's the story of Aggie, how would you how would you answer that? Well I'd start with I'm just Aggie. You know, this is just me. And there's so many things that come into the story. Rewinding back slightly, so I was born in the US, grew up in Hong Kong for 14 years, was then over in the UK and now currently in Singapore with my family. And all of those experiences, that movement that we've had, that transition all the way through my life has kind of played a part of who I am today and where I am physically, emotionally. But yeah, I'm just Aggie. Just Aggie. Yeah, well, we would say not just anything. And knowing you also, (laughs) I know that there's a lot, there's a lot behind the just Aggie. And so I love that you frame it in kind of the context of lots of experiences around the world. And so almost this kind of like global citizenship. So what has that given you in terms of the fabric of who you are? So much. I mean, a lot of my values are travel, adventure, exploring new things, happy to change things up. I'm not scared of change most of the time. Obviously, there's moments when it's overwhelming. But I think I also have a very diverse outlook. I'm a big part of us living in Singapore is we have mixed race children and we want them to grow up in a culture that is embraces that and encourages that rather than perhaps maybe a, a kind of childhood that I could have had in the UK in the depths of the countryside somewhere. So just a bit more open, I think, a bit more diverse. Yeah, I mean, I I know that you and I certainly have that kind of strong belief around and, and I have certainly have a value around diversity as well. I think it's so important you know, cognitive diversity and having, having representation. And, and it sounds like that's particularly important given the Mm -hmm. dynamics of your family as well. And so I know you in a professional context as a coach. So share a little bit more about, so you've shared, you're a citizen of the world, you're a mom, you've got a family here, and also you have this sort of thriving professional life. So tell us a little bit about that. To rewind slightly. So I used to be in financial services recruitment and just got to this point and I was like oh my gosh is this it you know I've got everything on paper that I possibly could have dreamed of I'm I'm a director I've got three teams I've got an amazing bonus salary all the rest of it and I just thought is this it am I gonna wake up in 10 years 20 years and just still be kind of going around this machine and I thought I'm just at my fundamental core I'm just not hugely happy it's just not filling me up it's not making me the best that I think that I could be. Although it played to some of my strengths, obviously that's why it worked. But I just thought I can't do this for much longer. And I actually lost two of my grandmothers in very close succession that had a huge impact on me. And I just thought life is really precious and powerful and I should grab it with both hands. And I have a really amazing opportunity to be able to do that. Um, I'd saved up some money So I just thought I'm going to take a year out and I'm going to quite simply work out what's going to make me happy. And during that time, I explored, I mean, Bex, you'll laugh. I did absolutely everything you could possibly think of. Like I was a total yes person. 
I did ceramics, financial statements, coding, yoga. I went motorcycling across the Himalayas with my husband. I mean, it was just an insane, insane few months. And during that time, I signed up for a course with City University, which was a coaching for business course. And I remember it was always on like a really dreary Tuesday evening, late at night and, you know, probably pouring, you know, freezing cold London weather. And I used to sit there at the end of the sessions at 10 o'clock at night and be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like, tell me more, like, give me more of this kind of amazingness. I'm just so, I was just so um, intrigued. It was a real light bulb moment when I thought, oh my gosh, you can actually do a career out of this. You can, you can make something of this. This can be my everything. So that really started this, this journey into coaching. And I now feel incredibly fortunate to do something that I genuinely love and feel unbelievably passionate about and the power of coaching. I mean, I don't need to, to preach to you. So from that moment, I just looked at equipping myself in any possible way that I could to start a business. Yeah, no, I, I I mean, let's definitely explore like where that's grown to because I know that there's been a journey since then as well. And I, I want to kind of pause on a couple of things that you've said. One, this kind of aha moment where you recognized, actually, I'm not feeling terribly fulfilled. What were the the signs, the things that you started to, to pay greater attention to? What were you listening to? What were you aware of? It almost was like a flip of control in that the job started to have such a handle on me. And I ultimately just didn't like the person that I was turning into. It was recruitment is an incredibly fast paced, quite competitive. You know, you're only as good as your last sale. Every week you're back at zero stats. Every month your fees are back to zero. And that kind of churn, that cycle, it just... I just didn't like the person I was becoming. I was kind of getting up in the morning and thinking this in my, in my core, in my gut, I'm a big believer in your kind of gut feeling and that your instinct is so powerful. And my instinct was like, this is just not working. I'm becoming too tight, too strained, too short. You know, I just, I didn't like that about myself. So much of what I believe I kind of stand for or the way that I come across is not in that it just didn't bring out the best in me I think ultimately in the end yeah I love that and I so agree with you like the body is such a important informer it sounds like that was definitely a big part of this for you and and also it takes some some belief that actually it's the right thing for me to do and to and to step out and then say I'm just going to completely explore as you said all these amazing different things that you want to explore and I, I can imagine people sitting listening that are feeling how you felt then, that are feeling a bit consumed by their work, especially during the pandemic. We know that. We know that based on our work, people are feeling completely overwhelmed. There's higher levels of burnout. There's exhaustion. There's all these things and dissatisfaction and um, a lack of fulfillment. And and so what, what do you think, besides then saying, this is not the person that I want to be, what then took you to the next step of I have to action? Like I have to do something. I think when I realized how much it was impacting my personal life was a a big moment for me. But also, like I said, with both of my grandmothers, I just thought, I don't know, it just it just all became so clear for me. And I feel really lucky. I know that a lot of people feel trapped where they are. But I had really planned for that. You know, I'm, I'm a natural saver on the whole. So I had planned for that. I had the resources. I had that freedom to be able to do it. I didn't have the responsibility of kids at the time. So I'm, I'm aware that I was incredibly kind of fortunate to be in that position. But I think we all still have decisions at the end of the day. And there are always options. There's always a different way to do things. And I think the freedom of the year that I had was incredible but even if you don't feel like you have that freedom, there's still other options. There's still other roads that you can explore and different things that you can do. You're, you're not stuck. That's the biggest problem. We feel so stuck, don't we? We feel so rooted and like, shit, I'm just not able to change anything. Whereas that's kind of the beauty of coaching as well is that you give those choices. You give the new perspectives. You see things from different angles. And 
realizing that and I was working with a coach at the time so I realized that I I was given the kind of gift of those options yeah and I think you're I think you're right I think it is about recognizing the choices that we have the things that that we can do to step more into that driver's seat and that's what it sounds like to me it was like there's this information that's coming at me and I have a choice to make either I can continue to feel like not aligned with who I am or I can do something about it and then then you talked about kind of your journey and then this exposure to coaching and as even as you were talking you're kind of coming to life as you were describing so what was it that lit you up and lights you up or the passion that you have for coaching I think for me and you'll get this but when you're with a client who doesn't feel like they have options or they're just so I mean even to use kind of the body of you know just so hunched and heavy you know just everything is so exhausting or overwhelming and everything's just down the power of coaching is that you stand stand tall. I'm a big believer in standing tall and your body, your whole body can shift. Everything feels lighter, easier, happier. People are more confident. And just by really simple tools and having that sounding board, people are able to get to that point where they have more energy or they're feeling more positive. They're able to tackle everything that comes their way. Hard times are not going to stop coming. Challenges, you know, that's part of life. We're we're always going to be knocked off centre But if you're clear not only on where your centre is, but also how quickly you can get back to it, I mean, your life can just be so much easier. It's kind of a no brainer. Like, why would you not want it to be easier? Mm. Yeah, I love that. And I love the acknowledgement that it's, it's not as though the, the, what's being advocated for here is, is something easy because life isn't, right? There's always going to be things. And so, and so then tell us what's taken you to, to where you are today. Because obviously you had this realization. Yes, coaching is something that I can do professionally. You've now got your own business doing it and you've written a book. So tell us about like what that journey has been like since that realization. So after sitting in dreary Farringdon on a Tuesday night or whatever it was, As mentioned, I had had coaching at two points in my life. Once at university when I was really struggling in exams, I would just get into exams and see black. I just couldn't kind of access all the best parts of my brain or the resourceful side. So I had had coaching then, but I also had coaching when I was deciding to leave um, the company that I was with. And I had really liked the way that both of them had worked with me. I thought that they just worked with me excellently So I went on and trained in the two areas that they had. So the Coaches Training Institute, CTI, but also neuro-linguistic programming. So I'm a certified NLP practitioner with neuroscience. And so these were really the kind of two foundations that I then started to build my, my business on. And what's brilliant is that they kind of work to different, different audiences, different people. The NLP is rooted in science. So there's real, depth and truth to the way that it's delivered whereas CTI is is more um values work and fulfillment which is also important but kind of the balance of the two often work quite well and so from there I just I started as everyone has to start by taking a big deep breath and contacting everyone I knew and saying please just give me a chance I'm trying this new thing out And I've been incredibly fortunate. My business has grown on word of mouth and referrals, which is just the best way because you get those like-minded individuals who come and experience the power of coaching. So from there, I've just continued to upskill and train. I'm now going through my master practitioner of NLP. I've added assessments, facilitation. So it's been quite a journey. And going back slightly, this was all in London when I originally started. And then three and a half years ago, we... Uh, relocated to Singapore so it's now set up here as well and the joys of virtual we can work with anyone around the world it's quite quite incredible no it is it's amazing and I think what you're pointing to here is even where we started the conversation which is that you're a coach and a business owner and an author and uh, you know and running businesses in in different parts of the world and and it so it is 
you know, also what I what I think people may may not realize is when people set up their own businesses, especially if they're the practitioner of it, is that you're also doing all these other things to like activate your business and keep your business going, which I think is amazing as well. And so tell me, tell me a bit. Like I want to get into the book because I think that um, as I said at the start, we're at this moment in time where we know that people are having it's a difficult time. That, let's be honest. And that doesn't mean that there aren't joys in it. That doesn't mean that you can't be at choice in, in the way that you live it. And yet there's still practically things that people are struggling with and we know. And, and one of the things that has really emerged through this pandemic is mental health, more mental health awareness, more people putting their hand up, talking about anxiety, talking about, about issues that they're facing. And obviously that is the premise really of your book. So tell us about the book and tell us about your motivation to write this book. So Generation Panic has really come about from my experience and rewinding to about a year and a half before I resigned. So also just to be clear, this when I made that decision, it, was, it wasn't like a snap decision. It was something that had been brewing and I probably should have done it a bit earlier, but I didn't have the guts. So just for all those listeners who are still in it, it's okay that it can take time. It's okay that you have to come to the decision on your own and feel ready for it. But a year and a half before that time, as I said, I was in a very fast paced, um, driven, high achieving role. And on top of it, I was getting married at the time. And I think the pressure of the two together just tipped me over the edge. And without realizing it, I suddenly was having panic attacks and I didn't even know what was happening. I was just like, my body has literally just taken over. I feel completely out of control. I don't feel myself whatsoever. Like, what the hell is happening to me? And it was really scary because I just couldn't regulate myself. I couldn't, I couldn't calm down. And I just didn't, I just didn't know what was happening. Had this ever happened to you before? Was this all new, a new experience? It was all a new experience. But interestingly, when I looked back at different moments, I think I had experienced anxiety. I just didn't have the terminology or the the knowledge to even kind of put that to frame it on I just didn't I just didn't have it name it so name it. yes there were times that I felt overwhelmed or on the back foot but I hadn't I just you know how we do we just kind of try and rationalize it in our brain so I'd been rationalizing rationally but all up in my head and then it got to this point where my body just took over and during that time, I found it really, really hard. Not only was I exhausted because my body was reacting, but I felt incredibly lonely as well. And all I wanted was someone or something that was just going to fix me and make me feel like myself again and good. And I searched high and low to find something that was just going to bring me back to me. And I, I ultimately couldn't find it. You know, I'd have, I'd read a book on anxiety and it'd be 350 pages on one technique or one specific thing to try. Or everyone was like, just try headspace and do meditation. I was like, it just doesn't work. My mind is like a gazillion miles an hour. And so all I wanted was everything that I could possibly try in one place so that I could return to it again and again. And so Generation Panic was really born out of that experience. I essentially wrote it for myself. I wrote it as a reminder of all the things that I had tried, all of these incredible tools and techniques to get me back on track. And it's been an amazing journey to write it, not only for myself, but I just kind of thought if it helps one other person, it's it's totally worthwhile. If one other person doesn't feel as horrendous as I felt and knows that they're not alone, and it's completely normal, and has very practical, easy to follow tools that will get them feeling good again. It's totally worth it. Yeah. And it's it's funny, because throughout this conversation, it's been, I've heard you really step into that place of like, well, what's the toolkit? What's the thing that I could, you know, so it's, it's really fascinating that then there's this book that is essentially a toolkit playbook for people to, to manage. And what, what are you seeing? Like, are you seeing this play out at a much greater scale in the work that you're doing with individuals? Are, Are What are, you know, we all know the stats and everything, but at the ground level, when you're talking to people, what are you starting to notice about about people's mental health right now? 
Overall, people are anxious. And I think what's great is that people are starting to have more conversations around that. Workplaces are encouraging that more. So it's being more spoken about. But I think we are in unbelievable times that we couldn't have predicted. The impact of that is is astronomical. And people are feeling very overwhelmed. And even small things, a lot of the conversations with clients are around working from home and all that that entails, you know, not having the boundaries, moving one meter here for dinner to bed to work and just it's it's no different or even just the lack of commute. So people usually you have this kind of wind up into work and you're getting ready for the day and you're mentally preparing. You might put on a nice outfit or makeup, whatever it might be, do your hair properly And then similarly, at the end of the day, you have an ability to kind of wind down and step out of that role and re-enter your home as as you. And people don't have that. And that's a huge problem because it breeds anxiety when you're unable to distinguish between the two. Overall, I think people are really struggling. I wrote it before all of the pandemic. This has been in the pipeline for years now, but... Mm. I'm very pleased that it's being released now because I think it will be monumental for people to change things that aren't working. Mm. You've got a book coming out. You've got this business that that you're running with clients, as you've described, across the world. You've got family. You've got you've got parents all you know all over the world. How how do you design and think about your life in a way that that maximizes your fulfillment, maximizes your sense of wholeness? Great question. So as you know, we had a very strict lockdown here in Singapore last year. And what that really taught me is it stripped everything back. And what's really important, like what's at the absolute core of what's essential to me, what makes me feel most alive, most fulfilled. And it is those simple things, the children, that they're happy and healthy, that we're together as a family. I feel incredibly grateful that I do something that I love so much. But Ultimately, everything is just an add-on to that very simple kind of nucleus of, of our family. And so when I think going forward about designing that, I mean, the balance is like an ever, <laughs> ever fluid, like changing, changing kind of goalpost that we're, we're constantly trying to strive for. And sometimes when I'm like, oh my gosh, I've totally nailed the balance today. Something will come around and whack me in the face and be like, no, no, no. You got too cocky with that. So um, I think it's having an awareness of what's really important and how I want to conduct my life. You know, where I sit today, my family is my absolute core. It's the non-negotiable. But then on top of that, I've got this book that's incredibly important to me. I have clients that mean the world to me and I absolutely love the work that we're doing. So finding that balance between them is often a struggle, but it's something that I'm always striving. I'm checking in often, trying to build my awareness of where I'm at, making sure that the balance doesn't swing out, finding the times that work best for me. I mean, an ongoing discovery. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like that check in and then also that ability to respond and recognize to in the moment information as it's coming in. And so I'm just wondering, like, if you were to think about the, the Aggie you know, of the past and where you are today, what what do you think, like for people listening, what do you want to celebrate about how you then take charge or what what is it about kind of where you are today that you feel is so impactful? I think where I am today is that I'm very clear about who I am and in particular who I am when I'm operating at my best. And so striving for that and knowing what I'm aiming for works for me because it's it's clear on where I'm trying to get to. I love that because actually, although you've just said it so eloquently, it's quite a big place to get to, to have that sense of self, to have that confidence of, of what does truly matter. And so if I'm if I'm listening to this and I'm feeling a bit disconnected from that, it's aspirational. But like what were some of the simple things that you think people could do to to get to that place? Because it's very like even as I'm talking, I feel like there's a different energy. It's like it's quite grounding, right? Mm. 
Yes. And grounded for me is a huge value of mine. And so it's a great kind of check in for me if I'm not feeling grounded, as in if I'm feeling anxious or on the back foot, how do I recenter myself? I am completely biased, obviously, but I think working with a coach is integral to this kind of work because it's incredibly hard to ask these questions, to have people act as that sounding board, to expand your awareness to help you build those new habits and patterns of behavior. That's really where a coach can come in to support you on that because quite frankly, it's inc- it's terrifying when you're stepping out of your comfort zone or trying something new, doing things differently, to not have that kind of cheerleader or someone who sees all, all that you're possible for, it just makes it a lot harder. But if you're not wanting or re- not ready or not in the space to have a coach, there's some simple things, even just thinking about, okay, well, when name a time in the past when you have operated your best. Think of a time that you have like truly excelled, like heart, body, soul, you're just totally in your groove. And that's the point of the book. You dip in and out and you find something. And if it works, great. If it doesn't, okay, cool, we'll leave it. Maybe it'll be irrelevant another time. But actually that constant taste testing and adding you know stacking like we're making a pizza just put on more toppings put the toppings you want you take off the olives if you don't want them and that's really the kind of fundamental premise of generation panic in the book is finding what works for you because we're all individual we need things that are tailored to us as to ourselves and so being able to dip in and out of this book and find what's most relevant is to me the most powerful part of this I, yes, and it, the the key thing here is, as you've described, is that the individualism of it all, and and also the idea that the first thing that you try and might not be the thing that that sticks or might not work, or it might work now and it might not work in the future. That it's an evolution, that it's a journey. Like I, I think often one of the disconnects that I have seen from people is this feeling that you know, that fulfillment, that success, that whatever your language is for it is some, is a place that you get to. And then once you're there, it's like a static, you know, it's, it, 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 you know, <laughs> Hooray! It's, yeah, exactly. Who I'm fulfilled done. Like, that it's, it's, okay, check out. <laughs> yeah. And, and as we know, like with all of these things, it's muscle that we build. It's a journey that we're on. You know, if we're looking at ways to, to really improve us, our anxiety, you know, it's something that we need to be conscious of and mindful of and experiment with and like, you know, all of these things that you've just described. So I think it's, um, it's a really important distinction that you're that you're pulling through here for people. Yes, I completely agree. And, you know, even for myself, I'll think, oh my gosh, you know, my anxiety is totally in check. I feel great. Da, 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 da. And then I might stop, you know, I might not do my deep breathing in the morning, or I might not take those 10 minutes to focus on on the day. And then I'll realize that actually it's something I need to continue to work at. This is something, it's not, like you say, this end goal It's something to continue and to continually apply for and strive for. Mm. And so cast your mind forward, you know, thinking about this sort of legacy that you're building, the, the, the work that you want your life to be about. What is it that you're really hopeful for with the work that you're doing now that you're creating? If I'm dreaming big, which is one of the chapters in the book, every single person in the world would have a copy of this book because I so believe in its power. Anxiety is still going to be there. That's that's a kind of given. It's how you respond to it, how you're reacting to it that's most powerful and finding it in the best possible way. Yeah. And so for people listening, because there's been tons of things that we've kind of covered, lots of different ground here. What what are maybe a couple of things that you want them to take away, some advice or some mantras that you live by that you think are helpful for people to consider? A couple of things. So if you work out what makes you drive, that can be very powerful. And there's a tool that I often do with clients, which is looking around your life purpose and what's the point of it all? And one of the parts of it is imagining what you would have on a billboard If you could have any message you want, millions of people drive past it every day, but are impacted by that message, what would it say? And the clearer you can get on that message, I think 
it is kind of that North Star statement that helps you get back to who you really are and what, what it's all about. So for me, when I see that billboard, it just says, be kind. It's so simple. Be kind. And if I can live by that, then great. I, I just want to give hope for someone who is feeling crappy that there are options out there and you're going to be okay and you're not alone. I think that's what I struggled with most is I felt so alone and like it would never end. Like I was going to be in that hellhole forever. And obviously I, I feel very fortunate for where I am, but that that hardest moment, the darkest point in my in my life so far has actually become my kind of greatest strength and the biggest part of light for my life you know this is just something that has driven me and given me so much so wherever you are hold on in there you're going to be all right and the second thing that actually um is at the start and end of generation panic is a piece from dr zeus oh the places you'll go which i just love And at the end, it says, congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. I love it. (laughs) Very, very powerful. So, yeah, goosebumps all over. It's it's a good one. (laughs) It's a good one. Before we wrap up, the book comes out next week. Where can people get their copy? Because obviously it sounds like something that, as you've described, you're hoping everybody in the world has. Um, But at least for listeners listening, if they want to get their hands on it, how can they do that? in many different ways. It's, um, it's on Amazon, Book Depository, Waterstones, Barnes & Noble. So find it online. There's also the Kindle version. And I've also recorded an audiobook, so you can hear my, my voice on repeat. Beautiful. Apologies for everyone. <laughs> Keep your eyes peeled. I mean, it's it's so exciting. Firstly, thank you for being um, here for this conversation, for sharing your insights, for being vulnerable about your own journey to, to getting to the place where you wrote the book, because I think that that was super powerful. And for taking the time to do the work to help other people, which is, um, you know, really uh, incredible. I, I myself am excited to read my copy um excited for people to get their hands on theirs um and i wish it all the best of luck uh, as, it, as it goes out into the world and makes the impacts that it undoubtedly will so thanks aggie for being with us today thank you so much bex it's been a pleasure thank you so much for joining me today for another episode of not just anything for women who want it whole If you enjoyed our discussion, be sure to subscribe to our weekly podcast and leave us a review. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here with us and we look forward to having you join again. And remember, be brave, be whole, be you.